how can I phrase this? It's basically the front love garden of a lady. So it's those kind of differences that kind of makes you laugh because it's like, oh my God, you know, just hit my fanny kind of thing. And we're over here, we were like, ah, <laughs> Um, because we're really immature. Greetings and welcome back to another reaction video. And in today's video, I'm going to be reacting to six reasons American English actually makes sense. Now, I'm really looking forward to this one. I've not done a Lust in the Pond video for a while, so I'm really, really looking forward to doing another reaction to the legendary Lawrence Brown of Lost in the Pond. I'm Mr. H and I'm on a mission to learn all things at USA. If you're new to the channel and that sounds good, then don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. I'm going to shut up. Let's get straight into it. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to English. <laughs> if you can understand the words that I'm saying now, that means you have at least a decent grasp of English and Lawrence speak. But one person's English, whether that be vocabulary, spelling or pronunciation, might not be the same as your English. And often differences like this lead people to be suspicious of the other person's English, to somehow think, if only in a jovial manner, that their brand of English is inferior to mine. <laughs> a common example of this, I have to concede, is when some of my fellow Brits like to criticise or poke fun at American English. And I have to admit, when I was younger, I was one of those Brits. But then I went to university and two things happened. One, I interacted with American students. And two, I did a useless degree in linguistics and took a module on English varieties. <laughs> I think for us, <clears throat> the funny things are bottom, and you guys call it a bottom, backside, or you call it fanny. So the, the word over here, fanny, is, is... How can I phrase this? It's basically the front love garden of a lady. So it's those kind of differences that kind of makes you laugh because it's like, oh my God, you know, just hit my fanny kind of thing. And we're over here, we were like, ah, because <laughs> um, we're really immature. Let's get back to it. And after that, my mind was open. American English wasn't wrong. It was fascinating. Mm. It's a variety of English whose story has often been lost to time. So yeah, I've heard this one before from Americans. You, as in the English, you created the language, but we perfected it. <laughs> Because just as there are countless fascinating histories behind the words we use in Britain, the same is also true of the United States. And so without further ado, here are six reasons that American English isn't wrong. The longer that I do this channel, the more examples I discover of words or language concepts. That just very quickly, I'm liking the, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think, are they pillowcases in the background? Quite similar to what we've got behind here. I like his background, looks nice. Lovely guy as well. We perceive to be American, but actually originated in Britain. And on this subject, I've talked extensively about soccer and aluminum, but I think my favorite example is the word herb. To us Brits, hearing Americans drop herb. Drop the H on the word herb can often feel weird. But here's the thing, back in the day, we used to do it. There was a slew of words that entered the English language via Old French that incorporated a silent H. This included honor, hour, hors d'oeuvre, and yes, herb. But Brits just stopped pronouncing it herb in, I want to say, the 19th century because it was soon considered the way commoners spoke and the upper classes can't be having that. And so eventually, <laughs> in Britain, it was dropped altogether and America, on the other side of the ocean, didn't get the memo. Now, I know over here, I'm not going to name any names and you would never know them anyway, but I know a couple of people who have, let's say, regional dialects, not in the West Country, or well, maybe some of them are in the West Country, but they've actually had speaking lessons to, to actually change their accent to be more sort of elevated and upper class and yes well absolutely darling and uh, yes uh, please pass me the uh, vodka martini um I, i'm not sure where that was going but yes it's funny it's funny people kind of drop or they they really make a conscious effort to drop their local accent to sound more elevated and more sort of elite and yes absolutely and um, we talk like that and when it comes to this there are actually two other things that make us brits a little bit hypocritical when judging the american pronunciation of herb Firstly, we're forever dropping ages. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but recently I've had an haircut. That's northern for haircut. Big differences between the north and the south. I'd say haircut. But yes, when he says that, northerners do kind of say haircut. But that's a regional thing in the UK. 
And secondly, before we start handing out diktats on how to pronounce the letter H, some would suggest we might want to learn how to pronounce the word H. Some, not me, I'm open to multiple interpretations. But the fact remains that in a dictionary, the word H ends in an H, but it doesn't start with one. Oh, and while we're on the subject of pronunciation, that brings us on to this. You know, in Britain, we're sometimes very quick to judge the way in which Americans pronounce words, maybe because it's so markedly different from the way we do. But this hasn't always been the case now, has it? Because as many of my subscribers have asked me over the years, Lawrence, is it true that features of American English are similar to the way in which people spoke in England in the 1600s? To some degree, yes. A good example of this is that back then, most of Britain would have pronounced the R in words like card. That linguistic phenomenon is known as roticity and is a large feature, of course, of American English today. And where I'm originally from in Dorset, and we like our R's, card. Hey. In Britain, it still survives in pockets, like in the southwest of England and also Scotland, but it's ceased to be a feature of British English in most other parts. Obviously, one of the big differences between our two forms of English is the way in which we spell words. And maybe because most of American English derive from its British equivalent, we in Britain feel almost duty-bound to voice our disapproval of how Americans spell words. But I feel like we have to be careful about that because there is, in fact, quite an orderly nature to a lot of American English spelling rules. You know, I used this example the other day. If you're ever confused as to why Americans use the suffix I-Z-E as opposed to I-S-E, then two things. That's not always the case. Because secondly, American English likes to distinguish between words that came from Greek and have the suffix I-Z-E and words that came from Old French that have the suffix I-S-E. So in American English, for every internalize, you also have exercise. In Britain, we tend to not make this distinction whether the word came from Old French or Greek. It usually ends in I-S-E. And to me, I'm perfectly fine with this as well. Additionally, we like to be puzzled as to why Americans drop the U in words like color and honor. But the truth is, we actually did the initial change. Because in Old French, from which words like this derive, the words colour and honour were spelled just as they are now in an American dictionary. One charge that I often hear get levelled at American English is that it doesn't have many kind of fantastical words like Britain does. But having lived here for as long as I have, and crucially having done this channel, I've learned that America has coined some absolutely gorgeous words, some of which are used only in the United States, some of which are now archaic, and some of which actually made it to the rest of the English-speaking world. So these words include snollygoster, cattywampus, fuddy-duddy, wangdoodle, pulchritudinous, humdinger, doohickey, valedictorian, lollapalooza, ornery, poppycock, not a British word, malarkey, cahoots, discombobulate, panhandle, conniption, and highfalutin. Now sometimes, every now and again, I'll be on Twitter, which was my first mistake, and someone will gain a lot yeah. of traction simply by saying, I hate the way Americans say soccer, it's football. Now I'm not going to go over the fact... Yeah, the British actually, or well, the English, called it soccer to start off with. I think it was to differentiate it from rugby, I think. Fact again that the word soccer was in fact coined in Britain. Instead, I'm going to highlight a fact that many people just seem to forget, and that is that soccer isn't unique to American English. The word is used in Canada, South Africa, Australia, Ireland, and occasionally England. Between you and me, it's mm. time we stop caring about this, especially since us Brits have been using American English all our lives. Yeah, it doesn't really bother me, to be honest. When I was a kid, I used to play something uh, called Sensible Soccer, and uh, yeah, it didn't bother me then, and it doesn't really bother me now, to be honest. I think it's one of those things we love to hate, but we don't, deep down, we, we're not really that bothered. You see, the thing is, the English language has a plethora of words that were coined in the United States. Sadly, plethora wasn't one of them. In addition to the hundreds, if not thousands, of technological words that the country has given us, it's also added gimmick, hangover, hassle, fudge, hindsight, lengthy, belittle, okay, and hello, to name a few. Language is ever-evolving, and whether we're talking about British, American, Australian, Canadian, or New Zealand English, so long as we understand each other, that's all that matters. Yep. Do you understand me throughout that? Right, well, we'll, we'll do some retakes. Wow, another absolutely classic from the legend that is known as Lawrence Brown from Lost in the Pond. Again, links in the description. Go check him out. Lovely guy. Again, what do you think of the video? Is there anything you'd like to add to this? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to drop a like if you did like the video. It really, really helps me out. Be interested to know, can you hear a difference in my accent as a Southern or Southwest versus Lawrence's accent? Can you hear the difference in how we say things? Again, I'm Mr. H and I'm on a mission to learn all things USA. 
If you're new to the channel and that sounds good, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. If you'd like to support the channel even more, we do have a join and members section. Check out the link in the pinned comments for all the fun, packed perks. And all that leaves me to say, I'm Mr. H. You're my friends. Just take care. God bless. See you on the next video.